wondering about the changing the film. So I had on the film I edited, I had quite a lot of puns, but they were that pun part was taken out. I like a pun as much as the next person. And it was a nice bit of interaction, but I thought one of the things that didn't make the cut because mm. it was already about, I think, five or six minutes, which was about the limit as, of what I thought was reasonable. Mm. And I didn't think it added much more than we already had. I think it was already quite clear from the... Uh, I mean, the puns are... Uh, I mean, in the context they were talking about them, it were from the, for the eye, for the written publications, and this is an vi audiovisual medium. And... Um, we got from their interaction and all these other, and the photographs and all those other sequences, uh, we got the message that they're having good fun. So I didn't think it was necessary to over egg the pudding, if you like, just to, to it was it was redundant. Okay. Um, I think actually, I was thinking about some of the stuff you did to kind of show the sort of socialising. So you did, you put in a lot more pictures from the actual socialising than I did you. You um, made it a bit longer, that sequence. I could have done three or four photos. You know, sometimes, even in a short film like this, you can do with just a little chance to relax and have a break. So when you have a musical sequence like that, you kind of, and you see the first three or four, and you know the music isn't going to end soon, you kind of know that, okay, I can just sit and relax for 20, 30 seconds and just absorb it passively without having to really focus so much. Of course, if it goes on too long, you lose the momentum. It really depends on the platform you're putting it on. You know, I mean, that's an eternity on TikTok. Um, it's not very long for a feature documentary, so I kind of put it somewhere in between. It may arguably still be a bit long, but there was also a great variety in the photographs. I thought, you know, different people, contexts, framings, situations, events. Uh, so it was also a chance to give, to, to showcase that it, you know, we've got more than three photographs to show this, and this has happened to a large number of people over a sustained period. And of course, you still want to give people enough time to absorb each photograph, you know, at least three or four seconds, even if it is all telling the same fundamental story. There's a value in showing of the diversity of, you know, time and space. And what other changes did you make to the film and why? What I told you all at the beginning is always have a plan, but always be ready to change it. That's the kind of art of the documentary director, I guess. So, um, and what a lot of people misunderstand when they see a, a, a pre-filming script, they think well, this is a documentary. How do you know what's going to happen? You can't script it. No, it's true, you can't, but you have to have a plan. And if you stick too rigidly, rigidly to that, you'll miss the opportunities that occur. This is the joy of real life, right? You never know what's going to happen. So, you know, we had a perfectly good plan initially, which was this five blocks. It would have made a perfectly good film. But as we were filming Paul doing that little errand for the, the lady, and as it became clear that there were three distinct locations, all of which had, you know, you could build a sequence out of a 20, 30, you know, 20, 30 second, one, even 90 second sequence out of, you know, outside his home, setting off the cycling, at the chemist and then delivering. It was so clear, that interview he did outside his house at the beginning, that I was, as he was saying it, I was thinking, well, actually this, you know, we could build a story about it. And then as we were driving from place to place, I thought, well, you know, that's maybe we can make this the scaffolding of the film. And it's not that we're binning the blocks that we had previously planned out, we just put them in between these things. The kind of thing happens all the time, you know, and, and sometimes it turns out you have a bright idea, you change it, and then you kind of realise, no, the first thing was good. You've got to go, and you go back to it. But you can think about it to a point, but until you actually put it on the timeline and play it out in real time and see what it's like, you don't know. I had a hunch based on experience that that would work. Keep asking yourself what's what best serves the story and what is the story, because the story can change as well. Right? You shouldn't have too rigid a concept of what it, the film you're making is either, because... Um, yeah, I thought it was, it was kind of interesting when we were filming the sequence about um, the uh, the concept of um, finding sort of images for the sequence. So we had the, had the idea of filming him getting onto the bike and sort of preparing to sort of set off. I think... As someone who does a lot of YouTube stuff, I'm kind of just used to going in and just filming um, and then kind of seeing 
what image what images or whatever fit with what I filmed. The constant tension you have in documentary filmmaking is artifice, right? It's not, mm. uh, you know, CCTV is documentary filmmaking. It's a bit boring to watch, right? Unless something mm. amazing happens right in front of you. So you're storytelling, you're making choices all the time. And it's a spectrum. Movies are made up things where you're paying actors to say lines that people have written up on a set that has been completely fabricated. That's one kind of storytelling. You know, th there's a basic understanding of what distinguishes fiction from documentary and that this is kind of, in some sense, real life that we're filming. But of course, in the process of telling the story, you're doing all sorts of artificial things. You know, for a start, you're showing up there with a the camera, which may influence things. And then it's just a matter of to what degree you want to interrupt real life. I mean, one one approach, and you know, many there have been many fantastic filmmakers who do this, is you try and absolutely minimize your presence. So you just show up with the camera and say, ignore me, and you interfere not at all, which is kind of what you're talking about with it sort of, as you describe it, YouTube approach. So it's a single take, you just keep the camera running and then afterwards when you get back, you worry about how, you, how you're gonna tell the story. That's one way of doing it. You know, the other way of doing it is to be really structured about it and think, you know, before you go construct the sequence in your mind or literally on paper, have a sequence, sequence of shots in mind and shoot them and, make, and do them again until you get them right. Say, no, can you go back and start again? You know. And the, it's a balance between that. It's a very, it's, there's no simple formula. You know, it depends on the day. You know, if someone's in a hurry, you can't ask them to do the same thing as you found with Paul. Like, you know, if you want to get a nice sequence for you to edit later on of someone riding on a bike past you, they've got to do it at least twice if you've got one camera, right? You want one wide shot where you just let them come and move through the frame. And then you want another one which is nice and tight and then you can track them or you can let them go through frame, all these decisions you make. So if you want to give yourself all those options in the edit, he's got to do it 10 times. Mm. That's too many, right? Once is the minimum, there's some kind of maximum and then you've got to, on the hoof, decide, you know, so, and there's lots of complications to that. You know, what's the time? Where do you have to be next? How annoyed is he getting? Is he getting tired? It's not like a perfect way of doing it. It's just, these are one of, ones of the millions of decisions you're making all the time. But the more decisions you're consciously making, the better your documentary will be, by and large, unless you just get lucky. If you want a sequence of someone on a bicycle, that may be the first time that you've filmed it. I've done it dozens of times before, or something like that. You need the separate cut, of, you need the wide shot, you need the close up, you need the close up of the foot on the pedals, the hands on the, on the handlebars and going in and out, hands going in and out of frame, foot coming in and out of frame. Then you can edit anything. Then you can make, you can expand the time you can make it a 10 second sequence or a, a minute sequence. You've got all the options there. But if you don't do that at the time, you don't have the options afterwards. If you only film it in real time, that's your only option. Or you speed it up or do something. But it comes from experience because until you've edited your own stuff, you filmed yourself, you don't know what the problems are, as I'm sure you found. You know, suddenly, right, um, the first time you film something, you think, I've done a, a fine job. I've got everything that happened. And then when you try and edit it and tell a story and compress time and do all those things you do in the edit, you suddenly realize you start cursing your, you know, cameraman Rachel, editor Rachel starts cursing cameraman Rachel for screwing it up. But next time cameraman Rachel will be, will do a better job, right? Because you've got that in your mind. So if you just iterate that over decades and dozens of, dozens of films and hundreds and thousands of sequences, you, you just pick up these tricks. Then the, the sequence method it kind of took less time because if you think about what you need, you just do it in fewer shots. Whereas the, me coming in and just filming loads you mean of it stuff. Take, it takes less, you mean it takes less time on screen? It takes less time to film. If you have an idea of what sequence you want, because if you're, yeah. if you go in there and film and you think well, about that, how to tell the story. That's been prepared. That's, been prepared. Yeah. That, that's, that's going in with a shot. I mean, you know, to start off, I would recommend having literally having a shot list, um, but with the experience, it's all in your head anyway. You just know, okay, wide shot, medium, tight, close-ups, mm -hmm. cutaways. If you just go, come away from every sequence of all the, those things, you've got ultimate flexibility. And and if you need to make it a, a 10 second sequence, you've got all the shots for that. If you need to make it last two minutes because you've got really nice audio to put over it that matches it, mm -hmm. then you, will, you can also do that. 
but only if you film that in the first place and you don't get a second chance of that unless mm. you, know, you go back and shoot it but that that's never as good I do, I do think also the other thing that was useful was having the blocks um you know thinking about what you actually want to have included in the piece because you kind of more focus and make sure you get something from each block if that makes sense well, you know, this, this, this is why it's unfortunate that, you know, you came in so late, no, through neither of our fault, but just so late in the game, because mm. you, you didn't get the whole benefit of the whole two month kind of process. But kind of what the film is, there's a certain procedure, you know, you have an idea, you research it, you write a treatment, you then when you get the green light, you write a shooting script, and then you get you come the details of what questions you ask, what you want to ask to elicit what answers then you know what lists a shot list every time you go out to film you, you start to thinking about these blocks and you say okay this is tv how can i show these blocks what's mm. the visualization of it so you've got this abstract story and then you've got the the medium of, of visual and you say how can i what pictures what am i going to see on screen in order to tell that part of the story mm. and then one informs the other but you know it's, it's a very dynamic process but i mean so, you know, you had a kind of really accelerated version of that and, you know, it's but it's great now. What you're doing now is to try and really absorb that and understand it and apply that next time. There's no substitute for just trying it, really. You can read as much as you like and watch as many movies or YouTube videos as you like, but until you actually do it, it's like like the, when you were, you got the camera, you're used, used to pointing the camera and taking video stuff, but it's completely different doing that when you're trying to shoot a sequence that you've already pre kind of blocked out, right? It's a different discipline. Is there anything else you think would be useful to mention about the the piece? Um... Well, I, did, I mean, I'm, you know, I'd be, it was very interesting for me, of course, to work with lots of different people and see their different approaches to it. Um, you know, because the thing is, you can always learn, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, I, I can get coming this as a mentor saying, Oh, sure, I know a lot more about documentary filmmaking than you. That's why I'm the mentor and you're the mentee. But that doesn't mean I've got nothing to learn at all. And you also fall into habits and certain ways of doing things and all sorts of things change. You know, technology changes. Storytelling changes as well. You know, with TikTok now and people's attention spans getting shorter and shorter. If you want to appeal to a certain demographic, then you've got to adapt your storytelling method as well. So... Uh, you know my the kind of i'm i'm you know my background is is in a time when you would let a shot run for 10 15 seconds routinely now if you show that to a 10 year old they kind of start to look at their watch or get distracted or look something you know get away with a 10 second shot because they they're ready to move on you know it's like watching a even for me now watching a you know um like laurel and hardy film or something like that from the 30s the pacing just seems really slow now now when i was a kid watching them it didn't seem slow um but now it seems slow it wouldn't we wouldn't do it that way anymore um which is not to say that it's good or bad either way it's just a commentary on you know it's always this balance with filmmaking between your story and your personal narrative and the way you want to tell it but you've also got to, if you want anyone to watch it you've got to be considerate of who's watching it and why they would do that and if you're putting obstacles in the way, whether it's by making it really fast cuts for an older audience or really slow cuts for a younger one, just to take one example, um, you're not helping your audience and then you're not helping yourself either because if people don't watch it or they get bored or frustrated after a minute or two or 10 seconds, you've lost them and they're not watching it anyway. So what's the point? Yeah. So I don't know. It's... it's uh, one of the, the beauties of filmmaking is there are, while there are many general principles that broadly apply, which is the kind of thing I'm trying to do with this, this mentoring, just the basics, you know, because definitively the people doing it aren't experienced and that's what they need. Um, you, it's also always true that there's, you can always break the rules, if, but you've got to kind of know what you're doing. You know, you might get lucky um, and uh do something inadvertently that works but basically the more conscious you are of everything the better your film will be and that's true of a youtube video or a documentary or a feature film you know the more you think about it and the more deliberate you are in your choices the more thinking you've done about it usually the 
better will be, especially if you, you're a creative person and thinking laterally and you collaborate with other like-minded people, then cumulatively, um, every, every little decision should improve the end product. And there's so many subtle, as you, you know, there's so many subtle decisions you're making all the time. Um, the thing is, when you start out, you're making a lot of them by omission. You, you, you're not deliberately making a decision. You're just doing it that, that way. The more you question everything and you say, why am I doing this? You may still have to come out with the same outcome. You may still decide to do it that way, but you're doing it for a reason. And it's a reason that you can explain to yourself as much as other people. And if, you, if, if there's a clear reason that you're explaining, then you can interrogate it. And then you can have a discussion with yourself or other people about comparing that with another approach. But unless you've identified it and you know what you're talking about it, you don't even have the discussion. So you can't get better then. So yeah, it's really, it's a very collaborative thing. It's a very, part of it is just about being mindful and aware of what you're doing and aware of the consequences of your decisions. That sounds very broad, but I think it is a very broad discipline. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, does that help? Yeah. Is that what you had in mind?